on uh, talking about American spirituality in a global context, trying to draw a little bit on uh, experience in the Soviet Union. Uh, last week I was talking about the uh, American dream and the, perhaps what we might call the Soviet dream. And the, uh, the thesis I was propounding was that the, the Soviet dream is broken apart for them and that therefore they, it's hard to find the glue that would hold the whole thing together or to find some motivating force especially the great contrast between the great hopes that were put forth by Lenin and Trotsky and the founders of the uh, Soviet Revolution, and they were going to transform the world, transform human nature, we were all going to become as good as Aristotle and Marx and so on, and, and all that sort of falling apart and trying to figure out what they're going to do about that. Uh, at the conference uh, I was at in, in Moscow, which was uh, hosted by IMEMO, which is one of their think tanks, an institute in the Soviet Academy of Sciences, during that time, um, uh, one of the uh, members of the institute uh, uh, gave me a paper that he had written. It was on, entitled uh, The Philosophy of Wealth. In fact, it was a thesis that he wrote, The Philosophy of Wealth. And uh, it's extolling the production of wealth and uh, how this is going to help and so on. Having realized that being wealthy is that's what we live for, it says. And, uh, well, it's just odd. I mean, you're in the Soviet Union and somebody is writing a thesis uh, in that sort of communist society is writing a paper on the philosophy of wealth. And, and he wanted to talk a lot about it. He gave me a copy of the outline of it and so on. He was very proud of this and so on. Just uh, somehow highlights for me this, uh, the changes going on in the Soviet Union. And all of this, of course, is world-shaking. Uh, I mean, we live in this transition time. I think it's wonderful uh, just to be dealing with these topics now so that we can stop and think a little bit about what's happening. You know, we've lived through uh, 1989, probably one of the most momentous years in the history of the world, and it'd be sort of easy to sleepwalk through it and think, well, yeah, it's another year, 1989. I mean, uh, but it, it seems valuable to me to stop and reflect on uh, the gigantic character of what is going on. And I think the, the Holy Father, um, is, uh, the Pope, is in tune with this. You know, he's been talking a lot about spiritual uh, Europe, and uh, he's calling a synod of the European hierarchies to try to get it together. And I think one of the theories has uh, been uh, the Pope's strategies all along, uh, that his, his main idea has been to unite East and West. That what he's been constantly open to are the Eastern Orthodox churches and how we could move closer to them. That would be one of the theories of why he's been so conservative on many matters that seem important to American Catholics. That if he, uh, for example, if we had the ordination of women, then it would make it harder for him to make a... Uh, uh, a union with the uh, Russian Orthodox churches. Well, I don't know what one makes of that, but it is clear that there are these momentous things going on and that we're, we're just in an exciting intellectual period and political economic period, and a lot of it has to do with this meeting of East and West. And that's part of what uh, I want to begin to talk about tonight is the, the whole meeting of Eastern and Western Christianity. And to, to, to do that, I want to uh, look a little bit at uh, what I encountered in the, in the Soviet Union in terms of the individuals who might be representative figures for me of where they're at religiously. Again, I must make my disclaimer, I'm not an expert on the Soviet Union or on East, Eastern Orthodox. I'm working with impressions and hoping that that will tell us something about our own uh, spirituality, in this case our spirituality of work and our attitudes towards uh, the world. That's uh, the purpose of this. So uh, the, the first representative figure is uh, Sergei. He a, has a doctorate in economics and works for the Institute, so he was one that we got to know pretty well. Well, I had marvelous conversations with Sergei, and uh, we could talk about most anything, and he was 
quick and witty and uh, engaged and so on. But when I would bring up any sort of religious topic, it was like he would go blank. It was a very odd sensation, this bright with it guy, when that topic was raised, would just be out of it. And, you know, my image is that it is one being tone deaf. He simply couldn't decipher it. He wasn't in tune with it at all. He's a product, of, he's a fairly young fellow, I think his late 30s, and a uh, product of educational system, learned Marxist Lenin in school, born into that philosophy to larger, still ties into uh, the greatness of Lenin and so on. Tone deaf to religious matters. I'd ask him something like a Russian Orthodox and what influence it might have on economy or what it might play. It was like he was saying, like, well, what are you talking about? It wasn't like he had an opinion one way or the other. It was just sort of, a, of an indifference. And, well, I think I, my best image is uh, the tone deafness. I sensed the same thing when we went through some of the churches in the Kremlin. We, uh, we had a guide, and uh, she was a young woman. And... Uh, other people in our party noted the same thing. We would go into the churches, which are really now in the Kremlin, are museums. They don't worship there, used as museums, beautiful icons and so on. And she had her spiel all down about what this icon meant and so on. But one sort of sense that it, it had no existential meaning to her. It would be like uh, describing some objective reality. She, again, had no ear for the icon or eye for them, I guess, would be the better metaphor. You know, eye for the icons. You could say, well, this was painted what year and by whom and for what, but no uh, sense of the, the religious importance of this whole situation. Well, that, that's one type of person, and I, I think a society that systematically denies the teaching of religion and persecuted religion over a long period of time uh, since the revolution in 1917, you're going to produce a certain number of people who are religiously tone deaf. Now, let me, um, there's another young woman, I mentioned her in my homily Sunday at our ma masses, but uh, uh, this is, her name is Irene. Irene's 27 years old and uh, told me that three years ago she became uh, a Christian. She converted to Russian Orthodoxy. And I said, well, you know, why it was that? Why did you do that? Were you influenced by somebody? She said, well, no, not really. You know, their parents weren't Christians. I mean, there was no religion in her home or as she grew up or anything. But she said, I felt a certain emptiness. I felt uh, I needed a peace and a security and a comfort. And she said she needed something that would help her with the ups and downs of life. She was looking for something more. And as a result of that, she reached out to the Russian Orthodox Church and became one. It was interesting. I asked her, you know, what sort of program they had for her when she wanted to join the Russian Orthodox Church. I was looking for a counterpart to our RCIA. It was very instructive that they don't have anything like that. At least she didn't, wherever she converted in whatever church. Uh, and I, I think I understood why that is, because in the Russian Orthodox Church, it is the very participation in the life of the community, especially in the liturgy, that is the teacher. You learn the faith by going into the church. The whole faith is on the uh, iconostasis, the uh, screen they kept in front of the altar. In fact, people who couldn't read or were illiterate learned the faith. It was a whole encyclopedia of the faith. You didn't have to go to RCIA, you just went into the church. And uh, the icons are all arranged in an order. And uh, up at the top, you'd have the Old Testament figures, and gradually worked their way down to the most important figures of Christ in the center and so on. It's... Um, the, didn't instruct her in any way, but just welcomed her, she said, into the community. That was uh, her sort of initiation and, and the baptism that she went through. Now, again, it, my sense is, and what I was told, is, is that there is a religious revival like this. Uh, while we were there on the Sunday, they had a hundred baptisms in the cathedral at the Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Moscow. They baptized a hundred people that Sunday coming on board. In the last year in Moscow alone, they have reopened 22 parishes. 
This is really uh, quite phenomenal. And one gets a sense when you talk to people that very often it's the young people. And uh, sometimes the story is that they are getting it from their grandparents. That's one of the great stories there, that it's the grandparents who, especially the grandmothers, I guess, who pass on the faith. That's their job, in a sense, a traditional kind of job. And some of the young people are talking to their grandparents and learning something about the faith and deciding to come on board in that way. So that would be a second type of person that I, I ran into in, in the Soviet Union. And then uh, a third type of person. Um, on Sunday, I went out to the uh, monastery that was founded by uh, St. Sergius in the 14th century in Zagorsk, which is northeast of Moscow. It seemed to me it was a drive about of an hour and 15 minutes, something like that. So he went out of Moscow, he passed all these uh, dachas, as they told us. And I always thought of these dachas as being these magnificent, sumptuous places uh, where, uh, you know, people had summer homes and so on. But evidently that word has a wider meaning because these dachas were, as we would look at it, driving down our highways and say shacks. But they were the way people got out of the city and uh, could be have some privacy, which many of them longed for, and grow some vegetables there that they wouldn't have to stand in line to, to get their produce and so on. Anyway, it was interesting to see these dachas, as they call them. Um, and we get to the monastery of the Holy Trinity, founded by St. Sergius. And it has been one of the ongoing, continuing mon monasteries, the most influential one, the best endowed one throughout Russian history, going back to the 14th century. And this St. Sergius is uh, really well regarded, um, and is so sort of thought of as a savior figure for his people. I, I'm, I was told, and I really haven't been able to verify this exactly, but in all the times that uh, Russia's been taken over by various people and Moscow's been sacked and so on, that the monastery there at Saint, uh, that St. Sergius founded has not been, that it's retained its independence. St. Sergius himself was a counselor to the prince, and uh, they wanted to make him patriarch of Moscow, but being a very holy man, he didn't want to get involved in that sort of power struggle, and so he just... Uh, was uh, willing to stay a monk, a very holy man, and etc. Well, it was interesting. You get to this monastery. I mean, there's busloads of people all over the place. Many buses coming in and, and making people making pilgrimages all over. That's one of the big things in Russia is to make a pilgrimage. Uh, it's, uh, part of their religious psyche, I think. You go someplace and it's a holy day for you, especially the, the people who were able to do it would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but it, to the monasteries also. Anyway, there's people all over and, uh, you know, very festive kind of atmosphere and so on. And, and uh, in the church, uh, during the period of time I was there, where the, the popular devotions were going on which often tells you, I think, more about people than, you know, the official liturgies. You know, you could learn a lot about what it means to be a Catholic in the United States by going to 40 hours or to stations of the cross or uh, being with people, say, the rosary after mass or whatever. You learn a lot about the piety. Well, um, I, I was an observer of the scene here, and... Uh, what, what was happening is, is the people, and I, my impression, uh, not shared by everybody who was there with me, but uh, dominantly older people lining up and carrying candles, very sort of a, um, not an orderly thing. I mean, sort of people pushing around and so on and carrying these candles and putting them into these candelabras. And, uh, and I was talking to one lady about, you know, the meaning of that, and that was her way of showing veneration to different saints, and especially asking for their protection. And you get an impression when you're talking in uh, Russia about the state's job is to protect. Uh, and it's often a militant sort of sense, like the Russians are being invaded, they were always coming in, and so you had to protect. And the great saints were often the people that they put to in battle, then were able to... Uh, uh, protected them and so they just been in fact the great cathedral of St. Joel in Red Square we see the 
Uh, outside the Kremlin walls is the red square and in the room of Lenin, and you always see those guys standing on top of Gorbachev standing on top of that. Well, at the end of the square is St. Basil's, a great church. And uh, Ivan the Terrible actually built that church in uh, naming it after St. Basil, one of what they call the Holy Fools. Those are people who are sort of anti-establishment holy people who walk around preaching the word and living ascetic life and so on uh, because he helped him win a battle against the invaders. So you get a sense of this. The people are putting in, in fact, uh, one lady, she had to get over to a certain uh, shrine area here because she had a particular problem that this saint needed to help her with. And again, none of that is foreign in terms of praying to St. Jude, the patron of uh, uh, helpless causes, isn't it? Hopeless causes and so on. Well, we have a, a lot of that, and it, it seems to be very intense there in the Soviet Union. Well, these people are walking out of these candles, and then they get lined up, and they're going along, and they get to the tomb of St. Sergius, and they have a whole ritual that everyone seems to know. You get up to the tomb and you bend over and you kiss the one part of it and you kiss it in the middle and then at, at, the, at the end, it looked like most of uh, had three bows going there. And then at the end of that, they get to the priest, the Orthodox priest, who is standing there chanting and alternately chanting petitions for people. People would give him a piece of paper, obviously asking for prayers for somebody, and he would chant and then a uh, prayer for them, and then over right in the corner would be a small group of women who were serving as a choir, and they would respond to his chant. Very often they sang for quite a while. Again, in the Orthodox churches, the musical instruments aren't the thing. In fact, often not allowed at all, but it's the human voice that would be uh, the, the great praiser of God, the only thing that would be pure enough to praise God. Well, as these people would go by, they would uh, come and kiss the crucifix that he would hold out to them, and then he would bless them with it, and then they would kiss his hand. And I was interested in the reactions. Uh, most of the older people, it just sort of seemed formal, and then a few people that were there, I noticed the priest would talk to them. It uh, seemed like he asked a little homily to them there. Uh, maybe thinking they know the traditions all that well and wanted to make sure they really understood what was happening. Their devotion, uh, their monastery, uh, Holy Trinity, uh, in terms of the icons. You get a sense of something about this uh, spirituality. But that forms the third grouping of people that I noted in the Soviet Union. That is the, the traditional uh, Orthodox Christians the ones who had kept the faith all this time, an underground faith, uh, gone through persecution. It was just a bit on public video to this afternoon talking about what the West could learn from the East in terms of us having the easy Christian life in a sense, and here's people who have been persecuted and had trouble, martyrdom's been a part of their life, they've had to go on underground in many ways, and, and yet they've preserved the faith at tremendous cost. Um, Maybe something to be learned about all of that. But then we do have the, the traditional people who have stayed with the faith in, in this way. While I was at St. Sergius, I met one of the monks. And, and it, was, it was an interesting kind of encounter. I was introduced to him as a Catholic priest. I put my hand out in traditional Western fashion to shake hands with him, and he very pointedly did not do that. Um, and I could have interpreted that as an unfriendly gesture, an unecumenical attitude, but then he reached into his pocket and uh, gave me, pulled an Easter egg, put an Easter egg and gave it to me. And I was assured that this was a sign of great friendship. Um, he was interested in conversation with me, however. His demeanor suggested to me, we're not going to talk this over, uh, <laughs> even though I had an interpreter there. Um, not terribly interested in dialogue, nor was he interested in a second effort to shake hands with him uh, as my reciprocal gesture of friendship. He was very helpful to me and suggested precisely the right icons that I should buy and uh, take home with me. Certain icons were not the kind to have. Other ones uh, would be the best of all icons, most important ones. 
central to the faith, especially Christ, the pantal crater, the judge of all, the cosmic Christ, looking right straight forward with the Bible open like this. And you see this often in the Russian icons, and it's open to the passage, uh, those who are burdened and heavy laden, come to me and I will refresh you which seems to be a key passage for them and makes a lot of sense if you're living in the Soviet Union or have lived in Russia for uh, any period of their history, I would say, unless you belong to the aristocracy. So the peasants and the people who live living there now would have a great feel for that, feeling heavy burden and fatigued by life. And it's the perfect icon fatigued by life, just worn down by the whole effort to get food and to survive. Christ uh, there is refreshment. And yet, in a way, a very human Christ, part of their piety as well. Well, the Russian Orthodox have not been big on ecumenical things, uh, this uh, part of this traditional Russian thing. The Council of Florence, when the delegates of Orthodoxy finally made up with the uh, with the Pope and uh, had the Union all straightened out and uh, signed the papers and everything in the 15th century, uh, the uh, Russians uh, took it back to the Russian Orthodox and uh, they wouldn't sign it. And they said that the, Gre that the Greeks had sold out to Rome. And very shortly after that, with the destruction and the taking of Constantinople in 1453, they interpreted that, aha, we were right. Constantinople was being punished for this uh, reaching out to the Romans. There's always been the feeling among the Russians that uh, we haven't kept the faith pure in the West. They, on the other hand, have been tremendously bound to the tradition. Um, the, the big thing in Russian Orthodoxy is not intellect and probing, but memory. And the way you solve an argument is not by coming up with uh, good reasons, but by finding the right authority to buttress the argument. Memory is what is treasured in this, in this Orthodox uh, outlook. They have kept the same liturgy that they received all the way through their history. Um, and uh, any attempt to deviate was, even in the slightest way, there's a major controversy in Orthodoxy about how you make the sign of the cross with two fingers or three fingers. And uh, those people introduced this three finger thing really uh, had to be uh, dealt with severely. In fact, you still have a group of what they call the old faithful or the, uh, the old Orthodox, um, people who have, have kept the traditions in a way that even the small changes that the official church made, they didn't go along with. You still have that group in uh, orthodoxy today. I, I really need to go back because that's the focus of my thing is on the Russian orthodox attitude towards the world and towards work and so on and how that might enrich our own understanding as in the Christian West. Uh, and I'll go on to my fourth category here of person that I encountered. And uh, this is um, the people who see some potential for religion as being for social change. And I, I, I think of one of the deputies from the Supreme Soviet in this regard. The, the questions for him around religion weren't is it true or not, or what about liturgy? or, uh, you know, icons. He wasn't into icons. But what he was into was, is there any potential reforming power in Christianity? Is there some social justice aspect? Is there some way to get our people off dead center? That became, as he was very attuned to Gorbachev's idea that we have to have a new spiritual world if the economy is going to work. Reminds me of a line in Marx that we almost never hear. Marx is always quoted as saying, religion was the opiate of the people. And he went on to say that religion is also the sigh of the oppressed people. I'm wondering what uh, they'll end up doing with that in terms of rethinking Marx. I mean, I, really, I don't really... Uh, 
uh, can't exegete that completely, but it suggests to me that in Marx's thought, there was something else about religion other than it was just a drug that kept you from being concerned about this world and put your mind on heaven. That's what, what's always quoted, right? Marx says that religion's the opiate of the people, and it's a drug, and therefore it, you, you won't get around to changing the world or making it better. As Marx said, the idea isn't to contemplate the world, it's to change it which I think flies in the face of a lot of orthodox theology. But he did also say that religion is the sigh of oppressed people. There's some longing in the heart for a better life, maybe, that we could uh, latch on to here. So I'm not saying that's an exhaustive list, but there's a kind of people I met, I ended up categorizing in my own mind. We got the people at tone deaf, and a lot of them because of the way they're educated. We've got young people who are turning to the faith, I think in growing numbers, and I predict that will continue to, to escalate. I think there's a lot of a sense of that, that it's going to happen there. And then we've got the traditional Orthodox people with their piety or contemplation and icons and so on. And then we've got at least some people who are asking the question, can uh, religion, can Christianity help us to change the economic order? Can it be an ally for us? Well, let me stop there and see if uh, anybody's got any questions to this point. Uh, Thank you. Very good question. Are, were there any Catholics represented? That that's, gives me a chance to expand this whole thing. Um, first of all, we've got to remember in the Soviet Union there's 15 republics. They have a tremendous pluralism. I mean, so different from uh, the, even from the way we think about it. I mean, they got larger problems of pluralism here. So you have in Azerbaijan, for example, a thriving Muslim community with mosques and one of the republics. You know, they're interacting with uh, the Christian Armenians and fighting one another. Uh, you have uh, uh, the, the Republic of Georgia that has uh, you know, a largely orthodox population which sort of keeps it all together. You've got the Lithuania, largely Catholic. You've got the Ukraine, which is a very interesting uh, sort of uh, situation. Since the, the interplay that's going on right now is a very tricky one for Gorbachev indeed. He's worried, of course, about the republic seceding, as we know. That's the Lithuania question, all the Baltic states, Estonia. I mean, I mean, they've made a move now to you know, go back to their old name and as a sign of wanting independence. So Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Um, Secession is in the air, and there's even uh, problems with the Ukraine. Now, the Ukraine being such an agricultural center for them, I mean, Russia really cannot think about losing the Ukraine. I mean, it's one thing to lose Lithuania, but the Ukraine would may be another problem. Now, in Ukraine, you have Catholic unions. That is, there's a, a large population of Catholics united with Rome. That was one of the points that Gorbachev and the Pope, the Pope and Gorbachev met. What was going to happen to that? And the Pope was pushing for a greater religious freedom. They don't have religious freedom in the Ukraine, the Catholics. In fact, right now, and I intend to talk more about this next week, but there is a document that I have that uh, the Supreme Soviet is now debating on religious liberty. And... Uh, I mean, it's an amazing thing, and that, that's one of the things the Pope was insistent on, that Gorbachev find a way to get, but his problem is not simple. Gorbachev, I mean, I'm convinced he's saying, great, give him religious freedom, we need it. But it's not simple, because the Russian Orthodox don't want him to have that freedom. So he's getting, and, and besides, the question is, if they get involved in that kind of fight, then you've got nationalistic sentiment going then you've got more of a sense of wanting to go their own direction. The, the, the problems, I mean, every time you talk to these people over there and say, well, what about this? I mean, it's, there's always a hundred aspects to it. it. Nothing falls neatly into place. I mean, I, I just imagine Gorbachev getting up every morning, you know, in some new, tremendous problem that doesn't seem to have any 
solution. So the Russian Orthodox are fighting this move of giving the freedom to the Catholics in the Ukraine. Now you also, right in Moscow, you have, I, I was told, I wasn't there, you have one Catholic church. You have a thriving Baptist community in Moscow. That's another thing that I've learned is that throughout the Russian history, you've had a lot, large sectarian movement. That is, the churches that don't fit into the normal, uh, you know, not the mainline Protestants and not the... Uh, Catholics, not the Russian Orthodox, but a lot of fringe kind of kind of groups that have had a lot of influence, and so on. And I believe that the the modern Baptists that are there are sort of heirs of that sectarian movement. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of church activity. Of course, right within the Kremlin, you know, you got these all these churches right in the Kremlin. Uh, it, it's a it's a sort of a strange mix. Um, I was told that, that the, the Catholic community there was doing well and, and is, you know, enjoying the new freedom now. Before, there was always um, a system in which people were watched and uh, people, there was known that people were church going. And the common punishment was that you couldn't travel then and you would never get a better job or, you know, you could never move forward economically. I know people have visited recently four or five years ago, encountering the Catholics there made, you know, very clear that, they, you know, there wasn't like they were going to be put in jail tomorrow if they went to church, but the communist system uh, would uh, finger them and it would be clear that they would not get some of the few privileges that other people had. That's another thing, I, when I visited the um, village where my grandparents lived, um, it was incredible to me. There's a little village out in the middle of nowhere, four and a half hours outside of Prague. And I get in there, I talk to the people who live in the house where my grandparents live, and uh, the fellow tells me not only was he forced to go on a collective farm, but the people who went to church in that little village, they were monitored, watched. There was surveillance in this tiny little village. And so it was known, and he said there was punishment for those people who went to church regularly. I, I really didn't find out what the punishment was. But, I mean, he gave you a sense of this pervasive effort to uh, intimidate religious. And that's the great significance, and the Supreme Soviet will, is debating this religious liberty document now. And uh, I, I want to talk about that next week in terms of individualism and Satan. So yeah, it, 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 you got to get a sense of the pluralism of religion in Russia. But they were never able, to, for example, to stamp out the, the Islam or the Muslims. I mean, there was never a way for Moscow to have that much control. There's 11 time zones in the Soviet Union. I mean, you're dealing with a monstrous country. And I mean, it's virtually impossible for Moscow to control everything. So the idea like that was all religious things were just stamped out, I mean, they just simply couldn't do it even with the surveillance system. Although the number of churches, I've got figures, I mean, especially under Khrushchev. <coughs> Khrushchev was one, I mean, we think of him sometimes as being more enlightened and open and maybe a forerunner to Gorbachev. But as a matter of fact, he was extremely anti-religious. And he felt, I think he bought the Marxist line that religion was messing him up and keeping him from the economic reforms. And he made a real new effort to stamp out church. Many churches uh, gone. I mean, I think it was down in his time probably to just a couple hundred. I, the figure escapes me. It was in the hundreds of churches from before where there was 54,000 or something. I mean, it was, it was down to very little. So it was a strong effort on that. Well, I think I can answer that best by trying to look at orthodoxy in general and look at Russian orthodoxy. In orthodoxy, you've got a broad agreement on many questions and many ways of doing things. And then you, what happens is it breaks down into national groupings. So you'd even have a Georgian Orthodox Church and a Russian Orthodox Church, Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And it gets, keeps getting multiplied because their theory was that any national grouping could have their own. But, I mean, the way I have best been able to understand it is in terms of the... Uh, 
of understanding what orthodoxy is all about and then uh, seeing maybe some of the distinctive characteristics of what we might call Russian orthodoxy. So I'd like to answer it in context. And, I, and when it gets down to specifics, like how Georgian orthodoxy would be different from Ukrainian or Russian, I, I really don't know. But my sense is that it's not great because the whole effort has been to conserve and to keep it the same. I, I, I do, that's the next section of what I want to do in the talk. See if there's any other questions, yeah? No. Uh, first, I, I didn't sense it, I mean, directly. There was a reporter that traveled with us and was with us uh, throughout, and her name was Stephanie Goldberg. And uh, she was, uh, I think, rather obviously Jewish, at least to us. And in all of our interactions, I saw no problem along that line with the people we interacted with. Um, although someone just told me today that that wouldn't be obvious to Russians, no, that they wouldn't recognize the name as being an obviously Jewish name as we would in the United States. I was told that today, that by other, um, uh, that in, when you, in a different country, different setting, names aren't obvious like that. But anyway, uh, I, I didn't, I had no direct experience with it. Of course, we know, I mean, more Jews are being let out now. The, that's open and opening up. Um, I think historically you get um, a lot of times you had the, the anti-Jewish sentiment. It was stirred up by the aristocracy um, and you had the pogroms, terrible things. Uh, and so there's a long history of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union and uh, I, I would have to think that that's there. Yeah. And, and it's a big problem. I believe I was, uh, well, actually there was another Jewish uh, person in our delegation, and I think he went to a service uh, over the weekend when we were there. I think there was a synagogue service in uh, Moscow that he went to, but he didn't tell me the details of it. So I, I, I not much uh, help beyond that. I didn't see it, and, but it's, I think it's in the air in many ways. When reading about it, I mean, historically, it's clearly there. And it's horrible, horrible. Increased because of the freedoms? Yes, I, I think there is one theory that that's what's going to happen. I think the Jewish community fears that, as a matter of fact. That the new religious freedom, oddly enough, will hurt them. The question is asked, where does the new freedom and, and the religious element fit into the economic thing? Um, of course, I mean, that's the, the, the thesis of Max Weber that I'm working with tonight is that the cultural factors, the religious factors, are absolutely crucial to the economy. And of course, that's de been a debated point and something that, you know, Marx you know, may well not have accepted. And, and many of the intellectuals over there would be very doubtful about that. In fact, my own sense was that they weren't all that familiar with Max Weber. But Max Weber is the one who wrote The uh, Spirit of Capitalism and the Protestant Ethic. That's where we get that phrase. And it's Weber who said that the reason capitalism works is because it's got a religious, cultural background to it that says work hard. You must work hard, and that's why must you work hard, because that proves that you're going to be saved. So that uh, while Calvin himself was uh, a little easier with that, he did say there was predestination to heaven and to hell, and that there were certain signs to know that, but his followers worked that out, especially here in the United States, to say, well, we know what the signs are. And the signs are that you work hard, and that you move ahead economically. 
you keep your nose to the grindstone and you are clean and uh, cleanliness is next to godliness so a whole ethic Protestant ethic Max Weber's thesis is that's what's made the American economy work and that without it the economy will fall apart and that's a many, uh, Daniel Bell has written a book about this question and sociologists analyze it, like, can we keep our economic system going when we lose the work ethic? And many people are worried about that. I mean, if people absenteeism at work, they don't work hard, you hire them, they don't do a good job. And uh, how can the economy keep going? And how do you get people to work hard? You know, especially if they, you know, make enough to get by or they're not interested in making more money or whatever. What's the incentive to work hard? And, of course, Weber's thesis, I think accepted by many people, is that it's only a religious type thing that can supply that motivation. And, of course, we're looking at our culture today and saying, well, do the young people want to work hard? Are they willing to sacrifice like the older generation did? and you know put on all these extra hours and and very often out of this sense like that's how you come close to god that's how you prove you're in the kingdom that's how you know you're getting to heaven and you look around in fact that's kind of often been the way we look at it. i mean people who have made it in the culture we think they're good and the people who are living in the enclaves, the ghettos, and the inner city, and don't make it into culture, there's a sort of an assumption right out of that same ethic, well, they're bad. That's why they're there. They're bad people. And so that's where we get all our crazy attitudes about the welfare system and these, you know, uh, total untruths that, and the uh, constant repeating of all these people on welfare driving Cadillacs and all of that. I mean, all that plays into this Calvinistic ethic. And, and uh, that, that's what set our own, uh, and, and that's not just for uh, Protestants. I mean, we have grown up in a Protestant country. I think that's uh, Catholics have come here as immigrants, and uh, we have been in one way or another in the melting pot, and we've sort of had to prove ourselves. We've had to be harder working than our neighbors. Catholics had to work harder to make it. And uh, as a matter of fact, Catholics have worked harder and have moved up. Now we're the most affluent Gentile group walking around. German Catholics, Polish Catholics, Irish Catholics, and so on. I'm going to get to your point. I just back on that, okay? I haven't forgotten the question. So that, it, and it's just part of my lecture that I chose to do now. <laughs> In response to your question. Uh, I mean, that was the point, wasn't it? It's a comparing of the, of the Russian Orthodox contemplative attitude to the Protestant ethic. The Protestant ethic is the Calvinistic worldview is not in the meditation, contemplation. I mean, you don't have a big monastic system developing out of Calvinism. Calvinism takes it out of the monasteries where you did have hard work, for sure, the Benedictine ideal, work and pray. And many people feel capitalism is rooted in the monastic life, where they went out and cleared the land and uh, made the civilization and they worked hard, so work and pray, being close to God that way. But what Calvin did was take it out of the monasteries and put it into the world and said, now, you, you know, it's not just monks that are supposed to work hard, but everybody has to work hard. And you build the kingdom in the world. Well, the Catholics who came to the United States, we, we moved into a Protestant country. Calvinistic uh, uh, notion, mentality, ethos that exists in this country. And so Catholics were figure, had to figure out what are they going to do. And that all of the stereotyping when Catholics came here was along the line that we hear about blacks today. Black, you know, Catholics are shiftless, they're dirty, they live in the big city, they have too many kids, they drink too much. They're not hard-working Calvinists is what it was. You know, it's just like those people in Italy and Spain. I mean, they close the stores in the middle of the afternoon. Go to Rome and they close up in the middle of the afternoon. Prime selling time. I mean, how to be working. <laughs> or it's taking a nap. You not only you take a nap, but after a little wine over lunch, you're so loggy when you get up, you can't work. <laughs> well, this is the Catholic. Catholic culture 
Well, the Catholics that come here had to figure out what to do, and the Catholics, uh, by and large, decided very clearly to get in the ballgame. And uh, almost everybody here knows uh, uh, the, the grandparents who worked like crazy to let, let us have a chance and so on. Well, the, the, so, Max Weber's thesis, I buy, culture and religious factors are important to the economy. If that breaks down, our economy might break down. I mean, are we going to have factories run if people don't come and they drink and they don't work hard when they're there? Productivity goes down, we're in trouble. What's the glue? What will hold it together? Well, I mean, it's not clear, is it? We can't figure out how are you going to make the next generation work hard other than having an ethic, a mindset, a religion that, that moves you in that direction. Now, to get to your question then, the Gorbachev says things like this that makes me think he understands this. And of course, my own bias is that Gorbachev is terrific. You know, I mean, I think he's outstanding, one of the great leaders we've ever had in the history of the world. But Gorbachev says you can't have the economy work without spiritual values. You can't do it. And he's quoted in this way. And they, the, the people under him, the people at Ememo, at the institutes, I don't think they understand that. That was my general sense. I mean, he, I even tried to engage one of their brilliant fellows, the most brilliant one we and met in this kind of conversation, like what will be the cultural force that makes the perestroika work? Where will the energy come from? Where do you get the motivation? Where do you get the worldview? And I don't think he had a sense of it. They haven't read Max Weber much. They're more interested in Marx and uh, that sort of analysis. 